Common Law Handbook For Jurors, Sheriffs, Bailiffs and Justices Court The court belongs to the sovereign, plaintiff people. Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition, page 318 defines the court as the person and suit of the sovereign, the place where the sovereign sojourns with his regal retinue, wherever that may be. In the U.S. Supreme Court case is Bill v. Stovall, the court was defined as an agency of the sovereign created by it directly or indirectly under its authority, consisting of one or more officers, established and maintained for the purpose of hearing and determining issues of law and fact regarding legal rights and alleged violations thereof, and of applying the sanctions of the law, authorized to exercise its powers in the course of law at times and places previously determined by lawful authority. Judd notice, or knowledge upon which a judge is bound to act without having, if proved in evidence. Black's Law 4th Edition. Take judicial notice that judges are bound by oath to obey American Jurisprudence Book. Judges sworn to obey. Since the Constitution is intended for the observance of the judiciary as well as other departments of government and the judges are sworn to support its provisions, the courts are not at liberty to overlook or disregard its commands or counteract evasions thereof. It is their duty in authorized proceedings to give full effect to the existing Constitution and to obey all constitutional provisions irrespective of their opinion as to the wisdom or the desirability of such provisions and irrespective of the consequences. Thus it is said that the courts should be in our alert to enforce the provisions of the United States Constitution and guard against their infringement by legislative fiat or otherwise in accordance with these basic principles. The rule is fixed that the duty in the proper case to declare a law unconstitutional cannot be declined and must be performed in accordance with the delivered judgment of the tribunal before which the validity of the enactment it is directly drawn into question. If the Constitution prescribes one rule and the statute another and a different rule, it is the duty of the courts to declare that the Constitution and not the statute governs in cases before them. For judgment. Law of the land. This Constitution, and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. U.S. Constitution Thus, the particular phraseology of the Constitution of the United States confirms and strengthens the principle, supposed to be essential to all written constitutions, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void, and that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument. After more than 200 years this decision still stands. Marbury B. Madison. All cases which have cited Marbury v. Madison case to the Supreme Court have never been overturned. See Shepard's citation of Marbury v. Madison. The Constitution was ordained and established by the people, for, the United States of America, a.k.a. government. Therefore government was created by an act of the people. Therefore the creation cannot trump the creator. If any statement, within any law, which is passed, is unconstitutional, the whole law is unconstitutional. Marbury v. Madison. Therefore no legislation, that statutes which would deprive a citizen of the rights of person or property without a regular trial, according to the course and usage of common law, would not be the law of the land. Oak v. Henderson. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. Miranda v. Arizona. Interpretation. Any constitutional provision intended to confer a benefit should be liberally construed in favor in the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. Then a constitution should receive a literal interpretation in favor of the citizen, is especially true, with respect to those provisions which were designed to safeguard the liberty and security of the citizen in regard to person and property. Very v. United States. No emergency has just cause to suppress the constitution. While an emergency cannot create power and no emergency justifies the violation of any of the provisions of the United States Constitution or states constitutions. Public emergency such as economic depression for especially liberal construction of constitutional powers and it has been declared that because of national emergency, it is the policy of the courts of times of national peril, so liberally to construe the special powers vested in the chief executive is to sustain and effectuate the purpose thereof, and to that end also more liberally to construe the constituted division and classification of the powers of the coordinate branches of the government and in so far as may not be clearly inconsistent with the Constitution. 16 M. Ewer. 2d. Sec. 98. Constitutions must be construed to reference the common law. 
As to the construction, with reference to common law, an important canon of construction is that constitutions must be construed to reference to the common law. The common law, so permitted destruction of the abatement of nuisances by summary proceedings, and it was never supposed that a constitutional provision was intended to interfere with this established principle, and although there is no common law of the United States in a sense of a national customary law as distinguished from the common law of England, adopted in the several states. In interpreting the federal constitution, recourse may still be had to the aid of the common law of England. It has been said that without reference to the common law, the language of the federal constitution could not be understood. Various facts of circumstances extrinsic to the constitution are often resorted to, by the courts, to aid them in determining its meaning. As previously noted however, such extrinsic aids may not be resorted to where the provision in the question is clear and unambiguous in such a case the courts must apply the terms of the constitution as written and they are not at liberty to search for meanings beyond the instrument. Conflicts. In all instances, where the court exercises its power to invalidate legislation on constitutional grounds, the conflict of the statute with the Constitution must be irreconcilable. Thus a statute is not to be declared unconstitutional unless so inconsistent with the Constitution that it cannot be enforced without a violation thereof. A clear incompatibility between law and the Constitution must exist before the judiciary is justified holding the law unconstitutional. This principle is of course in line with the rule that doubts as the constitutionality should be resolved in favor of the constitutionality and the beneficiary. Basis of all law. Nisi Prius courts rely on statutes, which is fiction of law, which seeks to control the behavior of the sovereign people who are under common law and not statutes, and who ordained and established the law. Therefore legislators cannot legislate the behavior of the people. No one is bound. No provision of the Constitution is designed to be without effect. Anything that is in conflict is null and void of law. Clearly, for a secondary law to come in conflict with the supreme law was illogical, for certainly, the supreme law would prevail over all other laws, and certainly our forefathers had intended that the supreme law would be the basis of all law, and for any law to come in conflict would be null and void of law. It would bear no power to enforce, it would bear no obligation to obey. It would purport to settle as if it had never existed, for unconstitutionality would date from the enactment of such a law. Not from the date so branded in an open court of law, no courts are bound to uphold it, and no citizens are bound to obey it. It operates as a near nullity or a fiction of law. The general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, whether federal or state, though having the form and name of law, is in reality no law, but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose, since unconstitutionality dates from the time of its enactment and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it, an unconstitutional law, in legal contemplation, is as inoperative as if it had never been passed. Such a statute lives a question that it purports to settle, just as it would be had the statute not ever been enacted. No repeal of an enactment is necessary, since an unconstitutional law is void. The general principles follows that it imposes no duty, converse no rights, creates no office, bestows no power of authority on anyone, affords no protection and justifies no acts performed under it. A contract which rests on an unconstitutional statute creates no obligation to be impaired by subsequent legislation. No one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law. No courts are bound to enforce it. Persons convicted and fined under a statute subsequently held unconstitutional may recover the fines paid. A void act cannot be legally inconsistent with a valid one and an unconstitutional law cannot operate to supersede an existing valid law. Indeed, insofar as a statute runs counter to the fundamental law of the land, it is superseded thereby. Since an unconstitutional statute cannot repeal, or in any way affect an existing one, if a repealing statute is unconstitutional, the statute which it attempts to repeal, remains in full force and effect and where a statute in which it attempts to repeal remains in full force and effect and where a clause repealing a prior law is inserted in the act, which act is unconstitutional and void, the provision of the repeal of the prior law will usually fall with it and will not be permitted to operate as repealing such prior law. The general principle stated above applied to the Constitution as well as the laws of the several states insofar as they are repugnant to the Constitution and laws of the United States. Congress cannot alter rights. On the other hand, it is clear that Congress cannot by authorization or ratification give the slightest effect to a state law or constitution which is in conflict with the Constitution of the United States. Rights do not come in degrees. 
although it is manifested that an unconstitutional provision in the statute is not cured because included in the same act with valid provisions and that there is no degree of constitutionality. States cannot license rights. A state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution, and that a flat license tax here involves restraints in advance the constitutional liberties of press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress their existence. That the ordinance is non-discriminatory and that it applies also to peddlers of wares and merchandise is immaterial. The liberties granted by the First Amendment are in a preferred position. Since the privilege in question is guaranteed by the federal constitution and exists independently of the state's authority, the inquiry as to whether the state has given something for which it cannot ask a return, is irrelevant. No state may convert any secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Mudu B. Penn. If the state does convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage the right with impunity. Shuttlesworth B. Birmingham no immunity. The right of action created by statute relating to deprivation under color of law, of a right secured by the Constitution and the laws of the United States and comes claims which are based solely on statutory violations of federal law and applied to the claim that claimants had been deprived of their rights, in some capacity, to which they were entitled. Owen B. Landependence 100 Volume. Supreme Court Reports. 1398, 1982, Main B. The Booted 100 Volume. Supreme Court Reports, 2502, 1982. Judges are under the illusion that they have absolute immunity, but all the cases that are cited making such a claim are without authority people and will fail in the federal and state courts in a court of record. Only the people are sovereign, all servants are under statutes and therefore liable to USC 18 and 42. Where there is no jurisdiction, there can be no discretion, they are not above the law when they commit a crime they will go to jail and are subject to civil suits. No man in this country is so high that he is above the law. No officer of the law may set that law at defiance with impunity. All the officers of the government, from the highest to the lowest, are creatures of the law and are bound to obey it. It is the only supreme power in our system of government, and every man who, by accepting office participates in its functions, is only the more strongly bound to submit to that supremacy, and to observe the limitations which it imposes on the exercise of the authority which it gives. U.S. B. Lee, 106 U.S. There is a general rule that a ministerial officer who acts wrongfully, although in good faith, is nevertheless liable in a civil action and cannot claim the immunity of the sovereign. Cooper v. O'Connor. Any judge who does not comply with his oath to the Constitution of the United States wars against that Constitution and engages in acts in violation of the supreme law of the land. The judge is engaged in acts of treason. Cooper. B. Aaron. A judge must be acting within his jurisdiction as to subject matter and person, to be entitled to immunity from civil action for his acts. Davis B. Burris. The courts are not bound by an officer's interpretation of the law under which he presumes to act. Hoffsummer v. Hayes. Where there is no jurisdiction, there can be no discretion, for discretion is incident to jurisdiction. Piper v. Pearson, cited in Bradley v. Fisher. Preamble the operative word is, establish, and ordain. The people existed in their own individual sovereignty before the Constitution was enabled. When the people establish a constitution, there is nothing in the word establish that signifies that they have yielded any of their sovereignty to the agency they have created. To interpret otherwise would convert the republic into a democracy, republic versus democracy, government. We the people are a republic, not a democracy, which is just the first step to an oligarchy. Republican, one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and are exercised by the people, either directly, or through representatives chosen by the people, to whom those powers are specially delegated. In Ray Duncan, Minor v. Happersett, Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition, Democracy. That form of government in which the sovereign power resides in and is exercised by the whole body of free citizens directly or indirectly through a system of representation, as distinguished from a monarchy, aristocracy, or oligarchy. Black's Law. Dictionary, 5th edition, p. 388, Bond B. U.S. SCOTUS recognizes personal sovereignty, June 16, 2011. Duty of Courts. It is the duty of the courts to be watchful for the constitutional rights of the citizen and against any stealthy encroachments thereon. 
Boyd v. United States. It will be an evil day for American liberty if the theory of a government outside supreme law finds lodgment in our constitutional jurisprudence. No higher duty rests upon this court than to exert its full authority to prevent all violations of the principles of the Constitution. Downs v. Bidwell. We judges have no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction which is given, than to usurp that which is not given. The one or the other would be treason to the Constitution. Cohen v. Virginia and U.S. v. Wolf. It may be that it is the obnoxious thing in its mildest form, but illegitimate and unconstitutional practices get their first footing in that way, namely, by silent approaches and slight deviations from legal modes of procedure. This can only be obviated by adhering to the rule that constitutional provisions for the security of persons and property should be liberally construed. A close and literal construction deprives them of half their efficacy, and leads to gradual depreciation of the right, as if it consisted more in sound than its substance. It is the duty of the courts to be watchful for the constitutional rights of the citizens, and against any stealthy encroachments thereon. Their motto should be obsta principis. Boyd v. United. Courts of Record. Courts of record and courts not of record. The former being those whose acts in judicial proceedings are enrolled, or recorded, for a perpetual memory and testimony, and which have power to fine or imprison for contempt. Error lies to their judgments, and they generally possess a seal. Courts not of record are those of inferior dignity, which have no power to fine or imprison, and in which the proceedings are not enrolled or recorded. At law. Bouvier's law, this phrase is used to point out that a thing is to be done according to the course of the common law, it is distinguished from a proceeding in equity. Any court that ignores due process, all statutory courts ignore due process and is not a common law court. Common law courts are, courts of record, in all courts of record the tribunal is the sovereign plaintiffs of the court or the jury. The justice is the administrator and reflects the wish of the sovereign, or jury, because the people rule, not government servants. The following, law of the land, proves this point. This constitution, and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Law of the land, due course of law, and, due process of law, are synonymous. People v. Skinner, Cal. State v. Rossi, Direct Plumbing Supply Co. v. City of Dayton, Stoner v. Higginson. In a court of record the acts and judicial proceedings are enrolled, whereas in courts not of record, the proceedings are not enrolled. The privilege of having these enrolled memorials constitutes the great leading distinction between courts of record and courts not of record. To be a court of record a court must have four characteristics, and may have a fifth, they are. 1. A judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions independently of the person of the magistrate designated generally. To hold it. Jones v. Jones. Led with v. Rosalski, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th ed. 425, 426. Judges or magistrates, N.Y. C.R.C. Law Section 30, N.Y. Code Section 30. 2. Proceeding according to the course of. Common law. 3. Its acts and judicial proceedings are enrolled, or recorded, for a perpetual memory. 4. Has power to fine or imprison for contempt. 5. Generally possesses a seal. The people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. Lansing v. Smith. A consequence of this prerogative is the legal ubiquity of the king. His majesty in the eye of the law is always present in all his courts, though he cannot personally distribute justice. His judges are the mirror by which the king's image is reflected. Blackstone's Commentaries, 270. Right to practice law. The term liberty denotes not merely freedom from bodily restraint but also the right of the individual to contract, to engage in any of the common occupations of life, to acquire useful knowledge, to marry, to establish a home and bring up children, to worship God according to the dictates of this own conscience. The established doctrine is that this liberty may not be interfered with, under the guise of protecting public interest, by legislative action. Meyer v. Nebraska A state cannot exclude a person from the practice of law or from any other occupation in a manner or for reasons that contravene the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. 
Schwer v. Board of Bar Examiners. There can be no sanction or penalty imposed upon one because of his exercise of constitutional rights. Sherrar v. Cullen. The practice of law cannot be licensed by any state. State. Schwer v. Board of Examiners. The practice of law is an occupation of common right. Sims v. Ahern. The assertion of federal rights, when plainly and reasonably made, are not to be defeated under the name of local practice. Davis v. Weckler, Stromberg v. California, NAACP v. Alabama. The right to file a lawsuit pro se is one of the most important rights under the Constitution and laws. Elmore v. McCammon. Right to assist. Litigants can be assisted by unlicensed laymen during judicial proceedings. Brotherhood of Trainmen v. Virginia X. Rel. Virginia State Bar v. Wainwright. Artersinger v. Hamlin. Sheriff. A next friend is a person who represents someone who is unable to tend to his or her own interest. Federal Rules of Civil Procedures, Rule 17, 28 U.S.C.A., Next Friend. Members of groups who are competent non-lawyers can assist other members of the group achieve the goals of the group in court without being charged with unauthorized practice of law. NAACP v. Button, United Mine Workers of America v. Gibbs, and Johnson v. Avery. There, every man is independent of all laws, except those prescribed by nature. He is not bound by any institutions formed by his fellowmen without his consent. Cruden v. Neal. Under our system of government upon the individuality and intelligence of the citizen, the state does not claim to control him per, except as his per conduct to others, leaving him per the sole judges to all that affects himself, herself. Mugler v. Kansas. The assertion of federal rights, when plainly and reasonably made, is not to be defeated under the name of local practice. Davis v. Weschler. A state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution. Murdoch v. Pennsylvania, 319 U.S. 105, at 113. The state cannot diminish rights of the people. Hurtado v. California, the claim and exercise of a constitutional right cannot be converted into a crime. Miller v. U.S. If the state converts a liberty into a privilege the citizen can engage in the right with impunity. Shuttlesworth v. Birmingham. First Principles. Liberty is mastered in three powers. 1. Light God. 2. Justice, synonymous with virtue, judicial process. 3. Rule of destiny, political process. Remove any one and you lose liberty. America has lost its way and only a virtuous people can guide her back. And so to that end, the people, by the mercy of God, have rediscovered the common, natural, law grand jury, and with his blessings virtue. Maxims of law avow that justice and virtue are synonymous. Before a man can implement justice he must first possess virtue, which the Bible declares flows from the Lord alone, Luke 6 19, and defines virtue as whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, Phil 4, 8. The Lord further expounds saying the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy, James 3.17, and that he that follows after it establishes righteousness and honor, Prov 21.21. Thomas Jefferson understood this when he said, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are of the gift of God? that they are not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just that his justice cannot sleep forever. George Washington understood this when he said, the favorable smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Benjamin Franklin understood this when he said, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. John Adams understood this when he said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Patrick Henry understood this when he said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded, not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. James Madison understood this when he said, 
We have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Noah Webster understood this when he said, No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. Father of American scholarship and education. The name game, people owe our citizen. 14th Amendment Article 1, Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Nation. In American constitutional law the word, state, is applied to the several members of the American Union, while the word, nation, is applied to the whole body of the people embraced within the jurisdiction of the federal government. Texas v. White. Privilege is merely an accessory of the debt which it secures, and falls with the extinguishment of the debt. Black's Law 4th Edition, 1891. Persons are divided by law into natural and artificial, corporations, or, bodies politic. Quasi-municipal corporations, bodies politic and corporate, created for the sole purpose of performing one or more municipal functions. Black's Law 4th Edition, 1891. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. People are supreme, not the state. Waring Burson. The mayor of Savannah, the state cannot diminish rights of the people. Hurtado B. California at the Revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people, and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. Chisholm v. Georgia. The people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. Lansing v. Smith. Ordain. To enact a constitution or law. State v. Dallas City.